Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Uh, doing just great. Thank you, Katie. Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines and our lone U.S. COVID statistic through today, July 25th. We invite you to submit questions or topics of interest down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with our abbreviated COVID statistic, average deaths per day were at 47 daily. The same week in 2023, we saw 70 deaths. Dr. Murphy, can I have your reaction on that number and the general COVID around the country? Well, <clears throat> that number is up uh, 10 points from last week. Now, that could just be a reporting blip, or it could be due to the recent uptick in cases that have already resulted in some deaths. We don't know. We have to look at this over a period of time because we're only getting the one hard metric, and that is people dying uh, from uh, COVID. Uh, that has followed pretty closely. So, you know, 47 a day is 17,311 people per year. It's a, it's a significant problem, and there is an uptick now. So what we do know is that um, it is definitely, we're having a, a summer wave, not as bad as last year. Uh, most of this is due to KP3, one of the Omicron variants that accounts for about a third of the cases, and KP2, about 13%. The West, South, and Midwest all show very high levels in wastewater measurement. So they, they have a whole surveillance system around the, the country, and it very high or high um, is, is in many parts of, of the United States. Uh, in California, which has a, all these states and municipalities, many of them have their own reporting systems. Um, in LA County, which is a huge county, uh, the rate of increase of viral activity has been accelerating. Um, positive cases, these are people tested in a hospital with a molecular test, jumped from 5.9% in June to 12.8% in July. So it basically doubling. Um, last summer, it was 13%. Uh, so it's still less than then. Um, and uh, for the week uh, ending uh, July 14th, there was an average of 359 new cases a day in LA County. That was up from 307 the previous week. A month earlier, it was only 154. It's just more evidence that this wave uh, is occurring. Hospitalizations are also up, um, but they remain uh, much uh, lower than last summer's peak that we had. Um, in, um, for the week ending uh, July 13th, there was an average of 287 COVID positive people per day in Los Angeles uh, County hospitals, and that was up from 139 a month before that. So, you know, it's it's just increasing. So number of cases, number of people testing positive, number of hospitalizations, even the death rate now may be up. And sticking on the topic of COVID, this time looking into some new research that was looking at a lot of stuff, COVID infection, reinfection, severity, and long COVID. Can you break down exactly what these researchers were looking for and what they found? Yeah, this is a group called RTI um, International in Durham, North Carolina, very well-known entity. And they studied more than 3 million U.S. cases from the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. Uh, this was published in a, a journal called Communications Medicine from Nature. And it appears that this level of severity you had on your first bout of COVID correlates with the next bout you have. In other words, if you had a severe case of COVID, you're, if you get COVID again, you're likely to get a severe case again. Not everyone, but a lot of people. The other kind of interesting thing that came out of that 
was that um, long COVID, which we've been saying is affecting approximately 7% of people, is much more common after the first bout of COVID and not subsequent uh, episodes of COVID. So that doesn't that doesn't uh, continue with the uh, the repeat infections that people get. That goes down over time. Um, so that's a that's a, you know kind of interesting uh, interesting news. Uh, we have thought really that you know the more COVID you had, the milder the cases would be. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. Now, sticking with infections, but moving over to H5N1, the avian flu, I understand there's been a couple more cases and some interesting research on possible asymptomatic infections. Can you bring us up to speed on all the new information? Yeah, so there are a couple more cases in Colorado. So the total number in the U.S. is 10. They were all from either birds or cows. There were no human-to-human -human transmission. All the people that were infected did well. Um, and so that's good news. In other words, human human transmission hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um, a small study in Michigan uh, among 35 asymptomatic farm workers looking at if they had developed antibodies, they had been exposed to H1, uh, uh, H5N1. No, they didn't find it. So it's a very small study, but it certainly is more encouraging than if a, half of them had been tested positive, something like that. So mm -hmm. it's not absolutely reassuring, but it's a, it's a good sign. Very good sign. Mm -hmm. And moving on to those pesky mosquitoes. Yeah. Two weeks ago, we sp spoke about the U.S. West Nile virus cases. At that point, there had been 15 confirmed, seven of which were neuroinvasive. Can you give us an update on how we're doing with West Nile virus now? Yeah, well, uh, as of July 23rd, supposedly there's 45 confirmed cases in 19 U.S. states. 24 of them, or you know, approximately half, were neuroinvasive. That means they got encephalitis. They had this is can be very serious, debilitating, and require require hospitalization. Um, so 19 states have reported this, um, but even in states where they aren't reporting it. A lot of this could just be due to how they're reported or, or the not diagnosed. Um, like New York and New Jersey are not reported any cases, but they've tested their mosquitoes and they have it. The mosquitoes are there. So it's uh, possible. Now, the whole course of West Nile virus is 80% of people that get infected don't have any symptoms at all. Then there's another group that have some symptoms, but they're very mild. But one in 150 gets really sick and gets encephalitis. So the mosquitoes are here, it's summertime. Um, from now till the end of the summer, people really have to be careful and doctors have to be aware. Uh, if somebody comes in with you know headache and more symptoms of central nervous system problem that think was not. Mm -hmm. And I understand that we saw these West Nile virus cases a little bit earlier in the season than we typically right. do. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. Um, this year, they've noted that the, the first cases came up earlier. So the mosquitoes are, are, uh, are probably able to, uh, are breeding earlier, um, probably due to the increase in global temperatures. Mm -hmm. Now, switching gears to something I had actually never heard of. This week in Arizona, there was a public health warning for hantavirus. Can you tell us what it is and why officials sent out this warning? Well, hantavirus um, was first uh, discovered and uh, identified by humans in 1993 when a member of one of the indigenous tribes on the Arizona-New Mexico border had an outbreak of this and many people died. Um, and so, you know, it was, uh, you know, a big deal. So it turns out it's from exposure to rodents. So, you know, uh, if you're in a, have a shed on your property or a barn, or there's some building where there's a lot of rodents, just coming in contact with them puts you at risk. Um, so what, in the past six months, there have been seven cases. Now that's not a lot, but three of them died. So almost half, you know, I mean, it's, it's about half the people are dying from hantavirus. 
So it's just, you know, it's a potentially fatal disease and people just have to be on the lookout. There's no treatment, there's no vaccine. Um, but, you know, somebody comes in sick, particularly if they're in the western part of the United States, very few east of the Mississippi. Uh, it's mostly in the in the uh, west and southwest. So just one more thing for doctors to be looking out for. Mm -hmm. Now, our final story of the day is on the global scale. We have talked a lot about the AIDS pandemic. Mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS have been on the forefront against the fight uh, of infectious diseases for generations. Can you give us an update on the global fight against the AIDS pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the the WHO and the NIH and CDC, everyone has all these goals uh, to get rid of uh, the AIDS uh, pandemic in the world. And the goal is commonly referred to as 95, 95, 95. And that's 95% of the people get um, know that they're infected, 95% are on treatment, 95% of those on treatment have undetectable virus. In other words, they have a very, very low level of virus that does not transmit to other people. So 95, 95, 95, if you reach those goals, the, the pandemic should extinguish itself. Now, where are we? We're nowhere close. So we have about 40 million people in the world living with HIV. Nine million of them, you know, almost a quarter, uh, are not getting any treatment. Uh, in 2023, 630,000 people um, died uh, from an AIDS-related cause. This is more than twice what the original projections are when this 95-95-95 goal uh, came forward. There's only, I understand, three countries that have been able to achieve this. So that's that's very unfortunate. Now, of course, it's still better than 2004 when there were 2.1 million deaths uh, due to AIDS. So, um, and this is at a time where many um, uh, funders have, you know, think, well, AIDS is over. You know, it's kind of like, think COVID is over. It's all over. It's not over. Um, and a lot of resources are actually being pulled back when this is the time, all we have to do is get to the point where there's um, the number of new infections is less than the number of people dying from HIV or with HIV, not even from HIV, but just with HIV. As soon as that happens, you have a downward trajectory and HIV will go away. So we're, we're not anywhere near it. Uh, at this particular point. Now, there was some very exciting news recently uh, about a pre-exposure treatment. In other words, people that are at risk and they take a medicine and then they, no matter what they do, they don't get HIV. This is great. So there's been a pill around for quite a while um, that costs about $75 per year cost um, that's not what you pay in the United States, but just worldwide, you can get generic drug for $75 per year. And that is highly effective. The problem is many people forget to take the medicine or they don't want to take the medicine or they have side effects from the medicine. And so that it doesn't work 100% of the time. Now there's a new drug uh, called lenacapavir that is given as an injection, a subcutaneous injection under the skin twice a year, so just once every six months, a study just came out showing that nobody who was got those injections, nobody got infected. Now, that's great. That's a huge improvement over everything else that's going on, plus you don't have to worry about taking a pill every day, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but you know, people forget to take it and whatever. Um, but right now that costs $40,000 a year person, so that's not gonna happen. Uh, unless they get a generic version uh, of that at some particular point. But it is certainly encouraging that either with a pill once a day or this injection twice a year, you can significantly prevent new infections. So that's just another part of the uh, armamentarium we have to uh, get rid of the uh, uh, HIV pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, millions of lives lost, billions of dollars spent trying to quell this pandemic. It would be a real shame if we got this far and then let things spiral out of control oh, again. Absolutely. The, it's, it's very unfortunate that these targets have been missed, but uh, we have to be vigilant and uh, continue with this because it's not going to, to go away without a worldwide effort. Mm -hmm. And on that note, Dr. Murphy, I'd like to thank you for your time, your expertise, breaking down the research and keeping us informed on all things infectious diseases. Well, thank you, Katie. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. If you have any questions, any suggested topics or comments, please leave them down below or at any of our social medias linked in the description. We'll see you next week and have a lovely weekend. Have a great weekend.